Welcome, everybody. That's not good enough. Come on. Hey, everybody. That's much better. That's what we want to hear, okay? You know, you're at an MSVU's News program, and this is very dear to my heart. A lot of you know that I, too, have multiple sclerosis, and I do these programs all around the country, right? Last year, we did 43 educational programs in 25 states. Once upon a time, when you guys first saw us here, we were only in the state of Florida. Now we're getting out there. We're getting to many underserved communities, and because there's a great need for this educational, what the educational purposes that we bring to them, the materials, the resources, and whatnot. We also do MS Neuro TV. So for anybody who has not seen what we have on MS Neuro TV once a month, you do get emails from me, and you can go to our website, and you can get registered, because everybody does get notification of these programs, and so we ask that you get onto MS Neuro TV and listen to the doctors that are there speaking, as well as then you can be on the phone with them afterwards to do a Q&A. Don't look at me up in the film right now, because I was skinny back then. All right. So anyway, we want to, you know, just let you know that what we're doing with MS Neuro TV, with the webinars, with, with our symposiums, our educational programs, the point is, is that there's a great need out there for people affected by MS, being the patients and the caregivers, friends, other family members, and whatnot. And we're out there, and we're just trying to provide and provide and provide, and that's why I get out there and do what I do. 142 hotel nights on the road for me last year. It's a lot of time away from the house. Got my family all upset. It's okay. I enjoyed the time on the road. All right. Now, tonight's program is called, Has MS Affected Your Walking or Movement? And we're going to have two great speakers up here. All right. And both of them are going to speak for about 30 minutes each, and then we're going to do 30 minutes of Q&A. So before we get into all of that, though, I want you all to thank who gave us the sponsorship to do tonight's program. It's very local and dear to your hearts, Collier Neurologic. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Baker wanted to make sure that you all got the information about you know, what they're doing these days, what they're doing in research, and what Nikki is able to do for you as well. So our first speaker is Nikki Varveris. I hope I said that right. She's in the back of the room. She gave me a thumbs up, so I must have done that right. All right, Nikki is Director of Physical Therapy. She's a Master of Science in Physical Therapy, practicing physical therapist for 25 years, specializes in movement disorders, vestibular rehabilitation, and postural imbalances. She's the owner of Physionetics Physical Therapy of Naples. She's the adjunct professor at FGCU, Department of Rehabilitation Sciences. She's the 2016 Patricia King Advancement in Clinical Practice Alumni Award recipient. Yay, Nikki! And she's published. She's a published author in the Journal of Women's Health Physical Therapy. Let's all welcome Nikki. So when Dr. Baker asked me to um, take part in this lecture series, I thought, great. This is my opportunity to educate the audience on um, what the vision of the American Physical Therapy Association is. And that vision is right there. And I'm going to read it so I don't miss anything. But our vision is transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. That's pretty appropriate for this lecture, right? We're talking about movement disorders in relation to MS. And here you have my professional organization's vision. And that is exactly what we do as physical therapists. Whether it's an orthopedic condition or a neurologic condition, our bottom line goal is to improve functional mobility so that that individual can live the best quality of life um, possible. So as it pertains to MS, what we specifically do, our role is to help you achieve and maintain functional movement, safety, a better quality of life, and independence. Now, I can spend way more time than 20 minutes or 30 minutes talking about movement, physical therapy, and MS, but I'm going to stick to gait, which is a fancy medical term for walking, for those of you who didn't know that. But 
Before I can talk about the impairments um, of walking as it pertains to MS, uh, it really would be beneficial for me to talk about what is gait or what is behind gait, the mechanics of gait, so that we can understand how it falls apart um, with someone who's involved, who has MS. Um, the average person knows how to walk, right? They don't think about walking. But um, if you ask them, well, how do you walk? They couldn't tell you that, unless their walking has been affected by either an injury or a neurologic condition. Just the same way that I can drive my car and I don't think about how the car is driving until something's wrong with the car. Now I have to think about, well, what's wrong with my car? And even at that point when the individual realizes or recognizes that they have a gait disturbance or can't walk, they don't know what they need to do to fix it or improve it. And that's really where we come in as physical therapists. So what are gait mechanics? There's really three phases to gait. And as simple as it seems, it's more complicated than I'm gonna uh, say for this, the sake of this lecture. But the first phase is the swing phase. So the swing phase is exactly what it says. It's when that leg swings. Two main muscles are responsible for that. One is the hip flexor muscle group, which is up here that allows me to bend my hip. And the second one is your shin muscle, known as the tibialis anterior, which helps lift my toes up or lift the foot off the ground. Those are the most two important parts of gait the swing phase. The second phase of it is the weight bearing or the weight acceptance phase. So once I swing my leg, comes through, now I'm ready to load it up. So what happens there? We need to have proper work between the front muscle group and the back muscle group, specifically of the knee joint, to stabilize and accept the weight that we're about to put on it. And the last phase is the single leg support phase or the single leg stance phase, which now is really the swing phase for the opposite leg. So I have to be able to bear my full weight on it, balance on it for a split second, and then take my swing on the other side. And in that case, a lot of things are involved. The, you need to have uh, stability of the pelvis and the hip joint. You have to have, again, co coordinated contraction of the front and back muscle groups, both of the knee and the ankle. You have to have good sensation, balance, and orientation in order to be able to unload. So factors now that impair ambulation in MS, we'll look at that and then see how that affects those three phases. The first one is muscle weakness. So muscle weakness could be either as a primary symptom directly related to the MS, or it could be secondary because of disuse. So a person who stops moving, then they're going to end up with more muscle weakness, which really had nothing to do with um, potential lesions. Along with that, with um, muscle weakness, we tend to see the side that is weak ends up making the opposite side um, muscle group tighter. So you get that weakness in the front line and then tightness in the back line. Next is sensory disturbances, whether it's vision, uh, diminished vision, diminished pro proprioception. Proprioception is receptors in our um, joints that tell the brain where we are in space. Or vestibular disturbances, the inner ear, one of the main compartments for, um, for balance. We can have specificity, um, increased tone, jerkiness of movement of the limbs, that could be an impairment. Cerebellar dysfunctions, um, our little brain basically, where it's the mastermind of coordination of movement. If that's affected, can definitely impair ambulation. And then exercise intolerance, whether it's just because of disuse, you know, I stop moving, guess what? I'm gonna, my, my um, uh, conditioning gets worse, right? or whether it's uh, heat intolerance related. 
So if we go back to look at those three swing phases, what exactly then happens? Well, guess what? In MS, the two main muscles that are involved or get weak tend to be the hip flexor and that anterior tibialis muscle or tibialis anterior. So exactly the two muscles we need in order to swing our leg. When that happens, especially the anterior tib muscle, when that gets weak, we see that the um, gastroc muscle or, or your calf muscle overpowers the front line and ends up tightening the heel cord. So you not only now can't lift the toes up because the muscle is weak, now you got a big muscle that's pulling your foot down, and so you, you get a double whammy there. So what happens when, when these guys can't do their job? The person ends up compensating. Well, I got to get my leg through. If I can't swing it this way, well, guess what? If I hike my hip up, I can clear the floor better. And then if I swing my leg around, now I can really clear the floor, right? But what's wrong with that? Then we end up with back pain and hip pain and knee pain, and then everything hurts. So, and on top of that, it's a very inefficient way of movement. So add that to the fact that you have some deconditioning and, and, and um, intolerance of movement to begin with. Now you're inefficient. Now you're going to get exhausted even more. So you're more likely not to walk as far or as much. So that's that phase. And we said what it leads to. Then the weight acceptance phase, so okay, so I swung my leg around, I was able to at least get clear over here, but now, again, I have that imbalance between the front line muscle being weak, the back line muscle being uh, too tight, and it's not going to give me the proper stability in my knee joint or my ankle joint, so again, I'm unsure, I don't know if I want to put my weight all the way there, so the tendency again is to put everything on the other side and kind of just skip through that weight-bearing phase. What does it lead to or what could it potentially lead to? Again, hip pain, ankle pain, back pain, and if you're using an assistive device, arm pain, you know, shoulder joint, so you see how that can lead into other problems. And then the last phase, the single um, leg support. One of the big things we see because of the imbalance of the muscles, one tight, one too weak, is when you get to this point, even if the person is using an assistive device, we tend to see an hyperextension of the knee. The knee tends to hyperextend as the person takes the swing on the other leg. Well, imagine how many times are you going to hyperextend that knee before you wear the knee joint out. Then you're up for a potential knee replacement and other orthopedic issues. So physical therapy approach to this. Obviously, what I just described isn't everybody's gait, whoever's involved um, in neuromuscular disorders specifically MS, that was just probably the classic gait deviation that we see was what I described. Doesn't mean that everybody's like that, so keep that in mind. But what needs to happen from a physical therapy standpoint is a proper assessment, seeing what is your current functional level and what's realistic as far as uh, setting up a goal but there's always room for some form of improvement, even if it's just a little bit. There really is always room for improvement if you get assessed by the right physical therapist. So establishing the right plan of care, again, going to the right physical therapist. There are physical therapists that specialize in neurological conditions and um, specifically MS2, but at least you wanna be with a physical therapist who has a neuro rehab background and not just orthopedics, because there's completely two different approaches. And if you fall into the wrong place, then you say, ah, therapy, therapy didn't work. It doesn't help. So um, be aware of that. And then again, setting up, coming up with individual treatment approach. It has to be neuro rehab oriented. And specifically, when I say neuro rehab, 
When we talk about strengthening, yes, it's important to go and lift weights and do specific individual muscle group strengthening. That's very important. But this is not functional. You know, the fact that I can just lift my bicep and do this is really not a functional movement. So there are techniques that we do as physical therapists that promote a functional movement pattern where why not work on being able to bring, let's say, my hand to my mouth so I can eat as opposed to just working my biceps. Or in, when it comes to gait, why not work on this movement instead of just sitting there and lifting my hip up and down? So there are, again, techniques, um, PNF techniques, proprioceptive neuromuscular uh, facilitation, or neurodevelopmental techniques that, as therapists, we're trained to do um, in regards to neurological conditions. Different than orthopedics. Stretching, very important. If you walk... Leave this room today, and if you don't remember anything else that I said, just stretch your heel cords every day. Just do a stance to stretch your heel cord. A very, very important. Just getting a little bit more ankle movement might allow you to clear the floor easier. My fascia release. That's different than massage or stretching. My fascia release, we have techniques that we can use to release the fascia when there's increased tone, when a muscle sits there at a short position for too long, the fascia bind down. Um, the fascia, for those of you who don't know, I always describe it as um, if you think about a chicken breast and you take the skin off and then that, there's that thin layer of uh, tissue on top of it, that's, you can think of that kind of as fascia. Now we have fascia inside, in between muscle fibers and everything as well, but that's sort of, if you think of fascia, think of that. So, and that doesn't really give much. It's not very flexible, so it needs to kind of be broken apart so that the muscle now can do what we want it to do. And working on endurance. You know, there's anti-gravity treadmills, there's aqua therapy, pool therapy, and breathing techniques. You'll be surprised how with just um, utilizing proper breath work, you can actually improve your endurance. Um, taking breaks in between exercises that you're doing or in between functional activities you're doing and just breathing the right way, you can really all of a sudden find that, hey, now I'm able to get up and do a little bit more, more than I used to be able to do. And joint protection education on, you know, maybe you really should use an, an ankle foot orthrosis, uh, an AFO, and save your knee from snapping back. Or maybe you really should be using uh, a certain knee brace to prevent you from hyperextending that knee. Uh, things like that. So really how to protect your joint, uh, proper walker adjustments so that you're not wearing out your shoulder joints and your elbow joints. Assistive device assessment. So sometimes people are so hesitant to get an assistive device. But the way I look at it is I always use an assistive device to improve the gait. All right? Not to say, sorry, now you have to use a walker. So that means that you're really not safe enough to just walk without it. It's not always about safety, but you'll be surprised how if you get trained the right way and use the assistive device to help improve the gait pattern, it'll, you might even be able to get off of it and have a better gait pattern. Again, not for everyone, but in, a, in some cases we've been able to do that. And then last but not least, prevent and prevention and management of secondary issues such as hip pain, back pain, uh, shoulder pain, and, and wearing out your joints. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with this final slide that basically says maintenance is progress. So a lot of times, especially in, in progressive neurologic conditions, patients say, well, you can't fix me. This is going to get worse anyway, so why should I come to you? And um, the answer I have to that is that if we can help you improve a little bit and then maintain that improvement 
and kind of slow down the progression of your condition, guess what? That's progress. So we don't have to necessarily fix you or make you better as whatever better is, but if we can help you maintain the highest level of function that you can have, then you've made progress. That's it, thank you. All right, well let's thank Nikki again. And now we're gonna have Dr. Baker come up. And before we just ask him to come up, I wanna read something to you about him, all right? And also know though that Dr. Baker is gonna be speaking for about 45 minutes, okay, 45 minutes and then we're gonna get into a 30 minute Q&A. All right, so Dr. Baker is a graduate of the University of South Florida College of Medicine, where he also completed his residency in neurology. He currently is in private practice in Naples, Florida, where he serves as the medical advisor to the Multiple Sclerosis Center of Southwest Florida. He cares for over 1,200 people with multiple sclerosis and has been currently, and has been and currently acts as the principal investigator in numerous phase two and phase three clinical trials in MS research. His practice focuses on patient-centered and compassionate approach to the comprehensive care of patients with multiple sclerosis, utilizing the most recent diagnostic technology and all currently approved disease-modifying therapies. He has special interest in the complementary therapy and complementary therapy and symptom management, including MS pain related syndromes and gender differences in multiple sclerosis. So now let's welcome Dr. Matthew Baker. This is my first presentation of 2019 and, and it's an honor to be here with all of you. And, um, and Nikki, thank you so much. I can't, I can't see you because of the lights, but Nikki and I have worked together for probably the past 15 years. And so she's my go-to therapist and um, she's a true scientist and educator and, and, and clinician. So I thought that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I've been to her as a patient. I send all my family members to her. She's managed to patch me up. Uh, several times. So um, this is my this is my handbook of MS. So if, uh, you know, before I see a patient, I, I read their chart and then I go to my handbook and I I review and I see. So um, so I looked up movement disorders and multiple sclerosis in my handbook and on page 221, there is a single paragraph on movement disorders and multiple sclerosis. And there are, in that paragraph, there are five sentences. So in, the, in this big book here, there's one page, one paragraph, five sentences, which specifically addresses movement and MS, which is ironic because the most visible symptom, I think, of multiple sclerosis is, is problems with movement. And um, so I, I'd like to talk about that tonight. And so as, as a uh, means of introduction and, and, um, and kind of setting the stage for this, um, we're going to look at, at some perspectives and, and definitions. And we've already put it in somewhat of a perspective in as much as we don't focus enough on it. And then we'll, we'll zero in on some specific disorders of movement. And I won't go too much into gait and ambulation because Nikki has covered that in, in a very uh, comprehensive and, and uh, eloquent way. And then we'll wrap it up with a summary and we'll get into our question and answer. So um, as a, a means of background, just so everyone's on the same page, we understand that MS is an immune-mediated disorder. Uh, it has both inflammatory and neurodegenerative components. And we understand now that this occurs simultaneously. So we used to believe that the inflammation started first and it set up a secondary neurodegenerative process. But we now know that that neurodegenerative process begins uh, early on in, in the disease course. And that becomes important as we age because then mobility becomes more effective. We see more accumulation of disability. Um, it's due to demyelination or loss of the normal fatty coat around the wire or the axon in the nervous system, uh, which allows for rapid conduction of electricity, efficient conduction of electricity and transmission of signals. And we used to have an, an uh, and if it gets bad enough, if it gets severe enough, we lose the actual um, axon, it becomes disrupted and, and broken. And then you have what's called conduction block. 
We used to believe that there were about 400,000 people in the United States with multiple sclerosis, but now we understand based on some autopsy information that it's probably higher, um, around a million people in the U.S. And it's a leading cause of, of non-traumatic disability in, in young adults. And it's characterized early on by relapses and, and later on by accumulation of disability, but relapses can oftentimes lead to permanent and persistent neurological deficit. So depending on where in the central nervous system, so optic nerve, brain, brain stem, um, Nikki talked about the, the little brain or the, the cerebellum, which is very important in, in movement, or, or spinal cord, depending on where these lesions occur in the nervous system, we have various disorders of, of movement or impairment of, of movement. So we define disorders of movement in several different ways. Um, movement is, is motion through space. This is kind of my definition here. I, I, I thought about it and I felt that purposeful movements require a synthesis of planning, of sensory and motor integration, reflexive adaptation. You have to be able to adapt and instantaneous modification depending on, on external forces. So and this, is, this is a very continuous process and a very complicated process. So as doctors, what do we do? We take simple terms and then we put a fancy word on it and we, we spit it back out at you so, uh, so we sound smart and then we can kind of charge more, more money. Right? So, that's, <laughs> so kinesis is, uh, is motion or movement and there's um, different types of movement disorders. So either you can have extra movement or you can have less movement. And if you have more movement than should be there, we call it a hyperkinetic movement disorder. If it's less, we call it a hypokinetic, and I'll talk about some of those. And then ataxia, we hear about that too. That, that's a, a loss of, of control of, of movement. So these are some definitions and, and some further background. Anybody know this guy here? Yeah, this is a guy named uh, Jean-Martin Charcot. He's a father of neurology. He's a famous French neurologist. And he really identified and defined multiple sclerosis through his, his clinical observations. And before there was MRI, uh, the clinical basis was depended in part on, on what he termed Charcot's triad. And it consisted of, interestingly enough, even though there's only one paragraph in my neurology handbook of, of multiple sclerosis, he just described it as tremors or shakiness, nystagmus, which is a, a rhythmic movement of the eyes uh, that is abnormal, and um, something involving the speech or what's called staccato speech. So sometimes in, in MS there can be a different speech pattern. It almost sounds like a, a, a speech pattern that you would hear in someone who is intoxicated because this involves a cerebellum and the cerebellum is, is the, the part of the brain that's very sensitive to alcohol. So one of the tests that we do when we evaluate a speech pattern is I have someone uh, repeat a, a, a phrase to me which I learned in neurology school and it is the, the ragged red fox ran around the rugged rock. And it took me four years to, to be able to say that in a, a fluent and fluid way. But patients who, report, who re repeat that back to me, you'll, you'll hear a certain speech pattern that is abnormal. So that's what Charcot uh, defined as his triad of MS. So if you had these three things, it was likely that you had multiple sclerosis. But there was no MRI then. There was no spinal fluid examination then. So he had to do a test that most insurance companies nowadays don't pay for, fortunately. And that test is an autopsy, so they don't cover, cover, cover that. So I, I don't like to recommend that test. But, so he would look at, at where the lesions were in the, in the brain and spinal cord. Anybody know that this person here, this, see, seen or, or, or heard about her? So this is uh, St. Litvina of Scheidem. Scheidem is a small town in, in, in a country that we call the Netherlands now, and it's, it's near Rotterdam, um, kind of in the south part of the country. And if you, I don't know if you can see it here, but if you really look at this, this portrait of her, you can see that her, her eyes don't quite align properly. So she was one of the first cases of multiple sclerosis that was described historically. And she was the patron saint of pain and suffering and also the patron saint of ice skating. And when she was 16, she was a really good ice skater. She fell on the ice and she had a rib fracture, and, and that trauma seemed to set off a, a course of 
progressive uh, neurological dysfunction and also some relapses. It was documented in, in the, the chronicles of this town uh, of Shidem. So uh, again, uh, historically, MS is defined by movement. If you think about ice skating, that's an extremely complicated uh, movement and, and series of movements involving balance and strength and, and power. This is another historical figure. This is uh, the illegitimate grandson of, of King George II, I believe. And you see the dates down here. So this is um, uh, Augustus Dest. And he started with some visual loss that occurred at the time of one of his friend's funeral. So there's a traumatic event in his life. And following this, he developed a course of neurological dysfunction that he, he chronicled in his diary. And when you look back, it's very much uh, consistent with multiple sclerosis. So he had tremors, spasms, and paralysis. So again, MS historically has been defined by uh, disorders of, of movement. All right, so these are some of the symptoms of MS, and there are visible symptoms. And on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, you see in a different, more invisible font, invisible symptoms. So the visible symptoms would be tremor, weakness, the ataxia or, or uh, gait disorder, spasticity can be visualized, the tightness of the muscles, abnormal eye movements, and, um, and sometimes bowel, bladder, uh, sexual dysfunction. Invisible uh, uh, symptoms, fatigue, pain, sensory symptoms, the cog fog, uh, and visual uh, disturbances. So these, things, these are, are symptoms that are apparent to the individual with MS, but may not be observable by their um, family, friends, uh, coworkers. This slide reminds me, these are the four buckets of, of MS management. So one way to avoid movement disorders is to avoid having it happen in the first place. And we do that through modifying the disease through medications called disease modifying therapy. So this is one bucket here, so the DMTs. The second is if you have a relapse or a, an attack of MS or an exacerbation, a treatment of that ac acute relapse is important. So you have to have a, a, a relapse management plan. The third bucket is symptom management. So identifying a movement disorder, diagnosing it, and having a plan to treat it symptomatically. And the, the fourth bucket that I, we should never forget about is lifestyle modification. So we're increasingly becoming more aware that MS is a lifestyle disease, meaning that you can, you can really help yourselves through healthy diet, exercise, physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy, avoiding certain triggers that make MS worse, like stress, um, um, cigarette smoking, poor diet, etc. So let's look at the hyperkinetic movement disorders. So we think about tremor. Tremor is extremely common in MS. If you examine patients, about half the time I can identify some form of tremor. It may not be severe, it might be subtle, but it, it's there. And tremors can be either postural, meaning if you hold your hand out, you might see an, a worsening of the tremor. It can be an intention tremor, which is with action. Um, rest tremors are not so common in MS. They're more common in Parkinson's disease, but there are cases reported in the literature, and I've seen it in clinical practice, where the tremor might be more apparent at rest. So it has the appearance of Parkinson's disease, but it's not Parkinson's disease. It's a tremor arising from multiple sclerosis. And then I included in here tremor of the eye or, or the nystagmus, because that can impair uh, mobility, can impair coordination as well. So if your eyes are bouncing around, how in the world are you supposed to put your hand where you want it to go visually? You you can't focus on that one point. Um, and it also affects balance and ambulation. Then there's a condition called paroxysmal dyskinesia. So this is a dyskinetic movement or an abnormal movement that occurs uh, at different points in time. So it comes and goes. So it's not there persistently. And then there's a, a type of movement disorder that we call choreoathetosis. So choreo comes from the root for chorea, which is like a dancing movement. And athetoid movements are small worm-like movements that can be visualized. Some people will have a facial spasm or twitching. 
uh, th that uh, we can see as a hyperkinetic movement disorder. And then I include it as a, a symptomatic uh, 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 movement disorder in, in multiple sclerosis, secondary restless leg syndrome. And that's a bit of a misnomer as well, because we, we think about restless leg commonly, but it doesn't have to be just the legs. It can be any limb or even involve the face. So a more appropriate term might be restless limb syndrome. Now, you can have that without MS, but it seems to be a fairly common uh, movement condition in multiple sclerosis as well. So let's look at some, some medical treatments for movement disorders and multiple sclerosis. So for tremors, we have a whole list of medications that may be helpful depending on the phenomenology or how the tremor appears. Um, sometimes we use a, a medication called propranolol, which is a blood pressure medicine uh, or beta blocker. Um, there's an old anti-seizure medicine called primidone or mycelene that can be used to treat tremor. Uh, Diamox is a, a, a type of anti seizure medicine that can be helpful. Um, certain anxiolytics or benzodiazepines like clonazepam or buspirone. There's an old uh, anti-tuberculosis drug called INH or isoniazid, which can be uh, useful. As well as um, in nystagmus, we use a medication for uh, Alzheimer's disease called memantine that, can, that seems to be very effective in reducing abnormal eye movements. In some forms of tremor, we've even in the use of deep brain stimulators, so electrically overriding the abnormal signals in the brain to, to reduce tremor and multiple sclerosis. And then there are several different adaptive devices uh, that can be used to minimize uh, the effects of the tremor, tremor and improve functionality in multiple sclerosis. So adding wrist weights or using heavier pens to reduce the, the tremor or heavier utensils. Uh, paroxysm paroxysmal dyskinesias. So these are movements that occur if you try to to um, uh, perform an activity with a limb, uh, and th these are usually what we call kinesiogenic dyskinesias rather than at rest. So in attempting to reach out, uh, there will be extra movements that that occur. Uh, carbamazepine, acetazolamide, or diamox, and sometimes an anti-seizure medicine called levetiracetam can be helpful. Then restless leg syndrome. So that's a sense that you have to move your limb. So that's an incredible urge to, to move a limb, either leg or arm. And that, uh, that urge is relieved by movement. Or, um, or if you get up and, and walk around, it can be um, extremely aggravating. It can interfere with your ability to get restful sleep. Um, and certain medications can be helpful in, in reducing these symptoms, like dopamine agonist, uh, pregabalin, gabapentin, uh, either long-acting or immediate-release gabapentin, clonazepam again. But you have to think about other secondary conditions. So restless limb syndrome can uh, be worsened by uh, anemia, specifically iron deficiency anemia. So I always like to check for that. With continued use of medications like dopamine agonists, you can actually have something called augmentation, where the symptoms get worse with medical therapy. And the symptoms tend to appear earlier in the day. Restless limb usually occurs in the latter parts of the day or in situations where you absolutely can't move. So when you're in the MRI scanner and they say, don't move, don't take a breath, that's when your leg wants to, to move and, and twitch. So for certain hyperkinetic uh, conditions like facial spasm, we can use botulinum toxin, various anticonvulsants or antispasmodics. And let's switch gears and focus on the hypokinetic movement disorder. So we've talked about extra movement. Now these are, are impairments of movement or uh, reduced movement. So that can be paresis or paralysis. Uh, paroxysmal dystonia, that's when the muscle groups that are supposed to relax on one side and contract on the other will contract at the same time. And uh, also um, spasms, which a, a lot of patients with MS uh, suffer with. So in, in dystonias, there's a certain part of the brain that can be affected by MS called the basal ganglia. And those are the, the parts of the brain that are also affected uh, in, in Parkinson's disease. They're, they're outlined here. Um, paresis usually involves uh, the corticospinal tracts in the spinal cord and in the brain. Spasms also arise uh, from 
uh, disruption of the, the electrical signals going from the brain through, through the spinal cord. Now the medical treatments for, for paresis or paralysis, if there's increased tone and spasticity, Botox can be employed or botulinum toxin. There are certain electrical stimulatory devices. Here's one as an example that helps with, with hand movements. Uh, it senses when, uh, when the, the hand needs to function and electrical stimulation is applied. And then certain adaptive uh, devices. From the standpoint of, of paroxysmal dystonia, various anticonvulsants can be used. Uh, clonopin, diazepam, or, or benzodiazepines. And the intermittent nature of this, uh, because it's paroxysmal, it comes and goes, makes Botox a, a less attractive uh, option for treatment. Spasticity is used, we, we use a lot of baclofen, we use a lot of tizanidine in reducing spasticity. Um, baclofen can be applied inside the nervous system through a, a pump, intrathecal baclofen, botulinum toxin. There's, there's ample evidence that uh, CBD and, and THC can be uh, helpful in reducing MS-related spasticities. It's uh, not av available as a pharmacologic product in the United States but elsewhere in the world there are one-to-one -one, uh, ratios that are employed to reduce spasticity as add-on therapy in multiple sclerosis. And then again, the benzodiazepines and, and Nikki um, covered uh, physical therapy. And the gait impairment I'm, I'm going to um, uh, just, just touch on, but it, it's the second most impactful symptom of MS uh, behind uh, fatigue. Um, it, it drives disability status. We measure disability in MS through what's called the expanded disability status scale, and that's heavily weighted on, on ambulation. And there's the different uh, patterns of gait, uh, and it can lead to worsening fatigue, uh, falls, uh, and, and fractures. So it's important to address that address this. Um, the use of, of braces can be, be very um, important and can aid in, in more effective and easier ambulation, which thereby reduces risk of falls, reduces uh, energy uh, expenditure, reduces nerve fiber fatigue, and, and uh, MS-related fatigue. Um, there's also, there are also some medications. So uh, Am Ampira is extended release dalfampridine. It's now available in a generic uh, form. Um, that can be helpful in improving walking in about 50% of patients with multiple sclerosis, but there are 50% of patients that, that don't respond to Ampira. So we're doing a clinical trial now on a sustained release form of amantadine, which is an older medication that formerly was used as a, an anti-flu medicine many years ago. Now the, the flu strains that it, uh, that it treated are now all resistant to amantadine, so it doesn't work in that fashion anymore. But it, it has been, um, there's some signal and some, some phase two trials that it can improve walking in multiple sclerosis. So we're fortunate enough to be a, a trial site. So if, if you are interested or uh, you want to talk to our, our research co coordinators, they're here tonight to answer any questions about that after uh, the program uh, concludes. Um, this is what's called a dictus band. Uh, what this does is provide some mechanical support for, for foot drop. A lot of therapists like this because you're, you're not fixing the, 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 the muscle as, as you would with an ankle foot orthotic. So this gives you a little help, but you're able to engage the muscles of the tibialis uh, anterior. Um, this is one of my favorite ones here, the flop stop. Anybody seen this before? So this is this is brilliant because it's something that if you're handy you could probably make yourself with you know, for like two or three dollars and go to Home Depot. But it's a bungee cord that attaches to whatever it is in your shoe uh, or flip flop, and then there's I don't know what it, what is this stuff that you wrap pipes in in your in your attic? It's you know to kind of protect you from getting a a blister. But for this I think they charge. Um, I think you can get two for eighty dollars from Canada, but but it's you know, in some people this works because they have enough strength to to get the foot up, but not quite enough where they're catching the toe. And as you fatigue uh, with with increasing ambulation, um, there uh, you'll ha you'll have have more weakness. Um, 
but I like that one. Here's an electrical device that, that, that senses movement of the leg and then gives a little shock over the, the uh, peroneal nerve and elevates the, elevates the foot. Um, the, the important point here is that in MS, the damage is in the central nervous system, but the peripheral nerves are still functioning uh, fine. Here's another device that also uh, works on, on the upper leg and uh, in the, the distal leg there, so it coordinates the, the movements in, in the entire leg on the left side. There's another example of an electrical device. This is um, the mechanism by which we think extended release dalfampridine works. It, it blocks potassium channels, and in a neuron, there has to be a gradient on the inside versus the outside of the, uh, the axon to allow for conduction of electricity. And when there's a, a demyelinated uh, axon, these potassium channels, they, they reorganize and they shift and they move and they become very leaky. And when they become leaky, you lose that potential gradient such that the electrical signal is not transmitted uh, effectively. So the way um, we think extended release dalfampridine works is by blocking these uh, potassium channels and reestablishing this uh, electrical gradient. So again, as I, as I mentioned, it works in about 40% uh, of people uh, who have some gait impairment. And the measurement that, that we look at is an improvement in what we term a 25-foot timed walk. So that's one of the tests that we do in clinic is we see how fast people are walking over 25 feet. And that doesn't seem like a big deal. So if you see an improvement about 20% in that 25-foot walk, so what? Well, that translates to improvements across a lot of different aspects of walking, and we measure that by a scale that we call the MSWS-12. So uh, it can improve um, uh, endurance, it can improve balance, it can improve uh, uh, climbing stairs, and people who are still running, it might improve running. So the improvement in, in the walking speed correlates with an improvement in other walking-related activities. And again, this is a sustained release amantadine. That's a compound that we're studying now. That works in a different way. So it's not focusing on the potassium channels, but it's focusing on, on, on effective transmission of, of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So in neurological illnesses, if there's short circuits and uh, short circuitry and disruption of electrical transmission, there's this underlying excitatory noise that's occurring. And so, so the real impulses, the real nerve impulses, the effective ones, get lost in all of that noise. So by modulating this glutamate uh, pathway or these glutamate pathways in the, in the central nervous system involving uh, the, the motor pathways and the walking pathways, we, can, we hope to see an improvement in, in walking ability. So this just shows the cycle of what can happen if someone has an impairment of, of gait. And so you have gait impairment, which leads to excessive energy use. That leads to nerve fiber fatigue, which leads to increasing weakness, which leads to more fatigue, which then leads to more gait impairment, and it becomes sort of a cyclical pattern. So if you can break that cycle somehow through any means, uh, you know, physical therapy, strengthening, conditioning, uh, improving your endurance, complementing that with maybe some medical therapies that improve nerve transmission, uh, augmenting that with the appropriate assist, assistive devices or, or bracing, uh, you can, you can uh, improve uh, walking, reduce fatigue, improve quality of life uh, and functionality. Now here's another example. Um, so if you have restless legs, you can't fall asleep, so your, your sleep latency is prolonged. That reduces your restorative sleep pattern. And you can't build up all your good neurotransmitters over the course of the evening. So that gives you secondary fatigue. And then that's just you, you feel bad the whole rest of the day. And then maybe your restless legs kick in earlier the next day. And, and again, another cycle. So if you can treat that symptom, identify it, and break the cycle, uh, it, you can improve quality of life. So in summary, in MS, certain movement disorders are, are common. In fact, Charcot 
the father of neurology and the, the doctor that defined MS, uh, really uh, in his triad said that, you know, there's tremor, there's uh, nystagmus, and there's a speech disorder, so Charcot's triad. So, so it's, it's certain mis movement disorders are very common, where the others are less common, and some movement disorders are very rare. So it's rare to see a movement disorder like Parkinson's or Parkinsonism in multiple sclerosis, but it has been described. And it correlates with the damage, the different movement disorders correlate with the damage in various neuroanatomical areas of the brain and, and spinal cord. Uh, significantly impacts um, disability and quality of life, these movement disorders. And the proper recognition and diagnosis can lead to the appropriate treatment and therefore improve quality of life. And so specific medications and devices complement lifestyle modification, PT, and occupational therapy. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude this part. Thank you. Um, how are you, doctor? Happy, happy New, New Year's. Year's. Oh, happy New Year's to you. Oh, can I say it in Spanish or should I? Feliz Año Nuevo. Thank Very good. You. Um, I don't know if it's possible if you could go back on the slide. There was something right there. I couldn't understand within those little pellets going in between, I think it's two joints, what's the purpose of those little fuzzy things in between the bones? What's so, that so this, this is a knee joint. Right. And I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I didn't get into this. This is some detailed neurochemistry. So this is a... This is a um, a synapse, so it's a, a, a communication between two neurons. And so this is the presynaptic neuron, this is a synapse, and this is a postsynaptic neuron. So that's how, how neurons communicate with each other. And um, in this, these are our receptors for glutamate in the postsynaptic neuron. And this is to remind me that this, the, these green things in here are the neurotransmitters. And so they're, they're sending information from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron. And when there's a, a problem in the motor pathways in MS, we think that there's a disruption in these uh, synapses. And so there's a lot of static and a lot of noise. And so by employing this medication, amantadine, we can modulate or modify this and kind of patch things things up electrically and chemically. Oh, closer to the mic. I was feeding back before, so I backed off. And now for the lovely young lady. When you were showing earlier about the muscles up on the hip, it's incredible that without that muscle working properly, there's no way one's leg could lift up the way it should lift. So you hit it right on the spot by talking about that. Thank you. I don't know if that was a question or should I, if I should elaborate on it, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> elaborate on that? Should I elaborate on that? Um, so... Even though, yes, you're correct that without that, uh, the main hip flexor really is the iliopsoas, and then there's the one of the quad muscles that also participates in hip flexion. So it's typically the iliopsoas that doesn't work or gets a little less um, uh, function as far as strength goes. And if we can kind of work on getting that... Um, other quad muscle to kick in, we could maybe get enough. We, we don't really need to lift our leg up this much, but that's where that neurodevelopmental or PNF techniques come in because you'll be surprised or just cueing the person to, um, you know, don't think so much about picking that leg up like that, but think more about maybe kicking something with your knee. And if you, if you can visualize that and, or we say, I a lot of times put my hand on the quad 
and give them that a little bit of an input saying, just think about what you think about pressing into my hand. And you'll be surprised how all of a sudden that movement comes. So, so yes, without that muscle, it's very hard to lift the leg up, but there's techniques that we can do to sort of, whether it's fooling the system or enhancing the system and um, to get enough clearance. Nikki, I've seen people, um, other trainers and whatnot, use like a furniture slide so people can move their yes, leg. Yep. Is that one of the modalities? That is, absolutely. So that is something that if, if you guys know, uh, like a furniture slider, glider, uh, basically what you're doing is you're taking the resistance away and working on that movement. So that's a great thing to do if you're able to stand safely holding on to something and just working on that movement back and forth, visualizing, memorizing, repeating the pattern. The more you repeat it, the more the nervous system is gonna kinda say, oh, okay, this is the pattern you want us to do. We use the Ultra-G anti-gravity treadmill. It's fantastic, because it, it unweighs you, it unloads you, and we have people walk in there, then we have them close their eyes and memorize and just think what the body's doing. Memorize it, repeat it, repeat it, and, and then there's a carryover. Great, thank you. Next Nikki, question can I, here. Nikki, can I ask you, do you think that's more, uh, maybe you could elaborate on what we term muscle memory, which may be more of just re rewiring your rewiring. nerves. Rewiring, exactly. Yeah. So it's not the muscles. Exactly. Yeah. It's building new connections. So rewiring the nervous system. Uh, neuroplasticity. I have to spell that out like that. So um, the same as we do with um, people who have suffered from a stroke. The more, the sooner, the quicker we get our hands on them, then we develop other pathways. Are, are you, uh, in, in your experience, are you amazed at, at how that happens in MS patients and, and other neurologic disease that people can rewire and relearn? It is, it, it really is. And when we see our patients do things that they never thought they could, even after years of not having done therapy, it really is amazing. So I always say it's never too late uh, we might take a break for a little bit and let the body kind of do what it's going to do, absorb what the new movement pattern they've learned, um, and then start again later, and you'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Dr. Beggar, hello. Um, you had given me a prescription for THC, and I never filled it, but you're saying that because my leg will just shoot out every once in a while, and, and I can't stop it. Uh, and it makes it very difficult to fall asleep sometimes. The THC helps that? Is that what I understood you to say? Or So in, in MS, um, we know that, that certain uh, cannabidiols, certain uh, components of medical cannabis can be helpful in MS symptoms such as spasms, spasticity, um, sleep, anxiety uh, and bladder dysfunction. So th there are certain symptoms that can be alleviated and we, we know this from, from ample medical studies. Uh, and so, so we use them as adjunctive therapies and, and it's legal in Florida now for, for MS patients. Yeah. Next question here. Just a quick question about the hip flexor. Uh, what, rec what exercise would you recommend at home besides the sliders to help strengthen that hip? Um, I would say the best thing to do is, it depends on where you're at right now. If you have the movement, then, then that's great working that way. But really working more of a functional pattern. Uh, there's PNF patterns that we like to do, which is, for example, in sitting, you can, if you're sitting and just thinking about lifting up the toes and coming into a diagonal, kind of an angular movement and then pressing down and coming out. So just working that pattern because now you're working again the whole system the, uh, that we need that coordinated movement. So rather than just uh, standing and doing marching per se, you're better off doing these, these PNF patterns and you can Google them and you'll find them. There's the two different patterns. Um, or lying down, doing the same thing, lying on your back and then working on these patterns of movement that really stimulate all of those muscle groups together would probably be more b beneficial. Mm -hmm. Question? 
Um, first, Nikki, thank you so much being a caregiver to my girlfriend here. Um, hearing everything that you said, really, I'm really going to push her to the therapy because I think that will really help her. Sorry to embarrass you, but it will. It really will. Um, so, Dr. Baker, um, I might have wrote my notes down wrong because I started eating my salad, but did you said Empyra is now generic? They have a generic for several generic manufactured uh, versions of that medication. So it's a sustained release dalfampridine. So. Okay, because that really helped with leg before, and and the doctor, her MS doctor, is up in Tampa, and they said, well, you know, there was no correlation between the two, and obviously there was because now that she's been off of it for two years. She's constantly with her cane. So I think that that definitely helped, but I wasn't sure if I wrote that down right. So that's excellent news. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so and, and the nervous system changes too. So if you were using it two years ago and the doctors felt it wasn't working, the pathways change and they remodel and rewire and and uh, different lesions can occur that will cause other other problems. And so it's worth a, a, another trial of it. And again, 40% you know, of people have a response to that medication. Um, if they don't, there are other, other things that, that one can try. Um, and, and the biggest barrier was oftentimes insurance coverage. Oh, that was the problem. Yeah. It was re absolutely ridiculous. I just felt like she should go back to England because of the insurance there. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassing her, but really, so, so now it there's was a, excellent A generic medicine. equivalent um, that lowers the, the tier. So there's different tiers, and, and so it might go from a non-covered branded drug to a tier two copay. All right, who's got the next question? My gosh, a whole room full of people, and you know everything? No, I didn't think so, come on. Let's get these well, questions going. so well and gave us all the information we need. Happy New Year to you both. Uh, Dr. Baker, you talked about clinical trials. Could you talk about the various clinical trials you're participating in and whether that what they are and what they're designed to do and maybe the kind of patients that you're looking for to enter into the trial, uh, what kind of entrance criteria you might be looking for? Well, the, the entrance criteria or the the inclusion exclusion criteria depends on the individual trial. For instance, with the 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 walking trial, it's it's really all comers from age 18 to 70, which is different from the typical MS trials because you think about trials of disease modifying therapies. We look at it in ages from 18 to 55, which, uh, you know, in my mind, is ageism and excludes a lot of, of people. But they want a, a, a younger, a more um, relapsing, inflammatory uh, type of trial. But but this trial for walking is is both for um, primary progressive relapsing MS. Uh, what we term secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So it doesn't matter what label of MS, and it goes from age 18 to 70, and you just have to have an impairment in your walking and be slower um, than, than a certain uh, parameter on this 25-foot time walk. And you can be using a, a walker, too. So uh, a lot of clinical trials with MS will exclude people if they're using a, a cane. So they have a, a, a tier or an upper limit for the uh, expanded disability status scale. So, uh, And then there are other medical conditions that, that are excluded. Or if you're on Ampira uh, and, and you don't want to come off of it, that might be an exclusion criteria because you can't take both. And then we're involved in some uh, relapsing MS trials of some new medications. Uh, we're involved in some of the monoclonal antibody uh, trials, so I, I call it, you know, super ocrelizumab, uh, you know, a, a cleaner version of that that's that's self-administered, um, and then some observational trials. So looking at people who've been on on a certain therapy to evaluate the long-term safety of that medication, and some prospective trials looking at, at cognition 
and multiple sclerosis with certain disease-modifying therapies. And I may have forgotten a few. And that's just in, in MS. We have uh, Parkinson's trials and Alzheimer's trials. But we're fortunate to have a, a great clinical trial team and a lot of different trials that might apply to a number of different patients. Question, great. Nikki, um, is there any exercise you can do to help you be able to lift your foot up? Um, uh, to lift the foot itself yes. to get dorsiflexion? To, yes. You know, uh, there is. And for one, definitely checking to make sure that the heel cord is not tight. That is one of the first things we, we look at. And you'll be surprised how many people, because even if, they, even if you just get to neutral, that's not quite enough to allow the foot to come up. So the gastroc is way, way more powerful than this little muscle in the front. So um, a lot of times, just by stretching the heel cord, then the person is able to lift the foot up. So then what we say is, what I like is um, getting the TheraBand putting the TheraBand around the, the foot. And even though the action you're doing is really the opposite move, but then what we say is resist the movement coming up so that you're training that muscle in an eccentric way. Then that's that can help with the strength this way. So, and, and the rubber band will give you some assistance. So again, depending on how weak it is, uh, it is. So using that rubber band around, pushing down and then controlling and not letting that band just flip the foot back up because of that weakness and just working it that way eccentrically is is a good way of doing it. Okay, so you're pushing the band down mm -hmm. and then and trying then resist to resisting it to, to come, come up. Yeah, so then okay. that muscle technically is working in the negative direction. And you'll be surprised, it's hard to do. But then at the same time, that band is giving you a little bit of work. So we go back and forth between, all right, now just try and lift it up and let the band help you. But then we say, okay, now resist it, don't let it pop your foot up. So again, you're working that muscle in a negative direction, which helps. Okay, you also mentioned something about um, stepping down or pushing down or like when you were giving your talk uh -huh. you talked about oh you mean after the heel strikes mm -hmm. and you step down yes yeah, so what happens is if well it depends so if a person has foot drop and they have really absolutely no control over here then therefore when they when they pick their foot up the foot just slaps down right so here's where you need that control of don't allow the foot to just flop down. So again, visualization, and we talk about, you know, all right, imagine you're pushing into my hand here, imagine you're pushing into my hand here. Just lift and think about the heel striking and then shifting your weight under control. So I call it walk with purpose, walk with intent. Don't let your leg just do what it wants to do. Think about the movement. And we, we use that type of stuff too to help. Okay. I don't Thank know if you. that answered it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So first off, I want to thank you both. Before we go on with more questions, I just want to thank you both because you both gave fantastic presentations. But Nikki, what about for all these exercises that you're talking about? Nobody's really asked how long they need to do it for. I know you need to do it all the time, but per day, what should they be doing? You should really be doing it not quite to the point of fatigue where you're going to end up throwing yourself in a uh, situation where then now you have to lie down for two days to recover. But we say every day you have to perform to just that level before you know, oh gosh, that's it. Um, and then what we do is we say, okay, so you go and now you say, you know, I, I just can't do one more. That's when we take a break. We work on breath work. And we visual, we tell the patient to visualize what you were just doing. So let's say if it was sit to stand, visualize you doing that work. You're performing that movement. During that time, they're inhaling, exhaling, visualizing. Then we say, all right, let's do another set. And you'll be surprised how all of a sudden, 
we can do another set. And then, so then the next day, now the endurance has built up, their to tolerance has built up, and every day you'll see potentially you're going to be able to tolerate more and more and more. So, but it definitely repetition and doing it just to that point before you go over the edge. Nikki, in, um, with regard to these exercises, many people with MS have one side of their body that is weaker than the other. Are you suggesting to do the exercises bilaterally or unilaterally? Uh, no, absolutely. Bilateral, you have to keep the other side in shape as well. So it definitely needs to be done bilateral. And, and that's a good point in that a lot of times we'll say, let's say in, in the case of gait, um, we say, okay, now just think about what your left side or uninvolved side is doing and try and repeat that same pattern on the, on the affected side. So we try and again, do that cross sort of um, incorporation of visualization. Let's get the nervous system to help out with, this is what this side's doing. Let's do the other side. And so little tricks like that help too. So, so we say, uh, just close your eyes and do the movement. Think about the movement you're doing on the good side. Now, try and mimic that same movement on the opposite side with your eyes closed and just lie there and just do the movement, do the movement. So bilateral for sure. Dr. Baker, earlier you mentioned restless leg syndrome. Does this have anything to do with those that have the evening or as they're getting into bed, leg cramps? Restless legs are different than leg cramps. Cramps are uh, this, this contraction uh, of the muscle. The re restless limb is a sense that you want to move the muscle or an uncomfortable sensation that's relieved by movements. Cramps are, are, are different. Nocturnal leg cramps are different. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about the restless leg syndrome? I, there are people that have asked about it, not just locally, but that are going to be watching this. Can you tell them what they can do to uh, better this? Well, the first thing is, is establishing an accurate diagnosis. So there are, is primary restless leg, which occurs independent of multiple sclerosis. And with MS, you, you're allowed to have other diseases too. So um, primary restless leg uh, can be hereditary. It can be uh, uh, de novo. Can, it can exist in, 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 you know, spontaneously in one individual. Secondary restless leg can be due to spinal canal stenosis, nerve root injury, multiple sclerosis, um, iron deficiency, anemia. It can occur in the context of, of pregnancy. Um, but again, it, it, it's a, it's a, uh, an urge that uh, you feel like you need to move the limb, creepy crawly sensation. Um, it's relieved by movement, can involve the upper extremities as well. And uh, oftentimes medication therapy is, is, the, is, the, is the best course of action. Great, thank you for that. Any other qu questions, questions? I'll get this and I'll be there. In relation to restless leg, Dr. Baker, I have heard um, that it is part of a triad of spasticity, where one part is um, the, the muscles, the opposing muscles working at the same time, which causes the lockup or the spasticity. And then I've heard the second part is the clonus, and the third part is lo uh, restless leg. Can you, can you comment on that? So the, I think the first thing that you're defining is, is when, when both the opposing muscle groups are contracting at the same time. And we really term that more of a dystonia. And then um, spasticity is, is the resistance to passive movement. And, and that's a little bit different than dystonia. And then clonus is, is more of a, of a reflex. It's uh, uh, a, a volley of of output of electricity from the spinal cord that, that follows that reflex pattern. And, and they're, they're all really related in part to an interruption of the signals in, in the spinal cord. Um, restless legs is, we don't know exactly where that uh, originates from in the nervous system, but it, it's more of a, a neurochemical imbalance or a neurochemical deficiency. Who had their hands up here? I 
have to do this all the time. Oh, that's okay. I have a couple questions. I won't touch your mic. We're good. Um, Nikki, are you taking new patients? Because <laughs> you're yes. phenomenal. Okay. <laughs> we are. Awesome. Um, everything is, I'm from the Cape. Everything that's great is down here in Collier. So that's just, we have to travel. Um, Dr. Baker, um, in the summer, the heat is brutal. And you know, well, first of all, you said stress and, and heat, which if you could tell me how to reduce stress and avoid stress, that would be amazing. You would be the Nobel Peace Prize winner if you can figure yeah, that out. Thank yay. You. But um, in the winter, when it's really cold, I'm, I'm stiff like Frankenstein. In the summer, it's weak. I can't get the leg going. No matter how many ice packs I wear, no matter if I'm even indoors, I was told by other doctors that the humidity indoors can still affect your walking. Um, any suggestions on, on how to get moving in the summer? There's just, um, no matter what I try, it's, it's just, um, not, not happening. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. yeah exactly. So you're very sen sensitive to, to heat and, and that's, uh, not uncommon, obviously in, in multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, I, I encourage a lot of aquatic therapy. Um, uh, sometimes cooling from the inside out can be beneficial so uh, when you're exercising or when you're doing your therapy if you have a you know, a big um, uh, you know, bottle of, of, of ice water so cooling your internal temperature will is more effective than trying to cool from the outside uh, so you know, oftentimes patients who are exercising with MS if you have that and you just sip on that that ice water uh, that can that can be helpful, but it, it's challenging. Um, perhaps some of the medications that that help with walking, like the dalfampridine, may help with with heat tolerance too. We don't we don't know for sure, but um, we think that 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 might be beneficial. All right, and um, Nikki, one more question for. Physical therapy to be effective again. We, you know, living in Cape Coral, I've been to an orthopedic um, physical therapist, which I I know what you're saying there. Um, how many times a week is it required to actually? I know you do homework, um, but actually going into a physical therapy office, how many times a week is recommended to actually be beneficial and see a difference? I, I'm definitely minimal twice a week. Yeah, if you can do three times, but distance obviously is an issue. But definitely twice a week. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Next question, anywhere? Well, then I'm going to again say thank you because that was great. And everybody, round of applause there. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for everybody. And thanks for Kaya Neurologic for putting this thank together. You. Yes, Yay! thank you.